to start the recording. It yells. <laughs> ah, me too, Ariel. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I am so excited for this session. Gigi, who is also here, uh, lovingly requested that I do a shadow work reading on her chart. And I offered that we could just open it up to the whole group and make it a group thing. So if anybody else wants to have a shadow work reading on their chart, uh, we could just make it a whole conversation and see what comes up. I love groups, the energy, the way everything comes together. So without further ado, I am going to spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about my personal interpretation of shadow work and how I work with that process. Um, there's a lot out there as far as different people interpreting it different ways and none of it is wrong or right for that matter. Um, just for each individual person, make sure you're using your BS meter uh, as always to feel for yourself what resonates and anything that doesn't, just leave it here. Uh, no worries. So. I'm gonna start with what is shadow work, in my opinion. Um, all of this is gonna be my opinion, so I'm gonna try not to say that a million times. But I do wanna be really clear that I am not formally trained as an astrologer or a psychologist for that matter. So I do like to tread lightly, especially when we're talking about shadows, um, our dark side, our hard feeling emotions that we may or may not want to tend to. Um, it can be tender territory, and I don't ever want to be destructive in this work. I want to provide a space where we can bring unconditional love for ourselves and work towards greater self-acceptance piece by piece. That's ultimately where we're headed with any of the shadow work conversations that I'm going to facilitate is that there are things about ourselves that we have long since rejected and those pieces make up our shadow. I'm gonna let Christy in here real quick. So those rejected pieces of ourselves. Hi, Christy, welcome. Hi. I am just going, I'm gonna mute you, but I'm just going through what is shadow work just to kind of give us a foundation here. And we're just at the beginning. So you haven't missed hardly anything. So if you subscribe to Carl Jung, uh, his version of psychology, his interpretation, he defines shadow as your unconscious self. So anything about yourself that is unconscious and that's really difficult and slippery to understand at first, if you're a beginner, I'm not sure the, the level of everyone that's here. So we're starting at beginner. Um, Things wind up in our shadow when we reject them and we chip them off of our self, our perceived self, who we know ourselves to be, because somebody else probably told us or rejected us for that behavior. So easiest when we have an example. So let's say when you're little, <laughs> you get told that you're too sensitive or you're dramatic or you're too emotional too many outbursts and that you need to behave, you need to calm down, your emotions get chipped off and put in your shadow and you spend however many years with a wall between you and your emotions because you were taught through early life that the emotions were not good. Other people reflected back to you that this is not acceptable behavior. And so you in your mind, based on how you're going to survive in this world, you thought, I just won't be that way. And then my tribe will accept me. I'll be acceptable if I'm no longer this thing. And it's an illusion. It doesn't, you're never acceptable. But like that, those shadow pieces, then they're almost like put into dormancy, right? They're in the shadow. We don't really have access to them. And eventually when we come back through shadow work, however many decades later, <laughs> Then we get to start pulling these pieces out or rather my personal, how it works for me or how I try to let it work is the pieces kind of walk up out of the shadow one at a time. And they're like, here I am and I am ready to be embraced by you and loved by you. And 
I want a seat at the table. I am part of you. And for us to live the sole mission that we came here to live, you got to go get all those pieces out of the shadow because all of them, all the different sides of who we are, have a say that help guide us on that soul path that we came here to live. So if we're leaving our emotions in the shadow or our voice or our desire to be seen or whatever we were told when we were small, stop doing that. That's, that's not okay. Um, those things end up in your shadow and now it's our work to bring it back here. So, or rather to allow it to come back into our full self. So in terms of what is shadow work, I see it exclusively as a practice of self-love, deepening the love that you have for yourself. Because at the end of the day, you think about that little girl who was told she was too sensitive and it was me, I was told that. And my emotions spent decades in my shadow and I was not allowing myself to access them. But that was all like, how to say that basically the things that wind up in our shadow don't make us a victim. They actually end up playing their part in kind of a supercharged way because like losing my emotional connection for so many years, now that I have it back and I'm working with it in such an organic way, letting it come to me and finding my way through it in a way that's really authentic to me. Um, I got to think it's an even more powerful and pure connection with that part of myself than if I had never lost it and had to go get it back. So, you know, we all have shadows and we can choose to look at it however we want. I see your kitty. Um, <laughs> that was nice. Um, and really it is a matter of how you want to look at it. I think People will come to shadow work in their own time. Gigi and I were just talking about this and I'm so glad to kind of incorporate this piece of there are two key ingredients required to engage in shadow work and have it be productive. The first is a sense of worthiness. So feeling like you deserve to elevate beyond the hard emotions that you're feeling, the suffering, the emotional, mental, physical suffering that you're living, you believe that you deserve something better. And whether you believe it outright or you believe it on some deep level, like your soul knows it to be true because it is, um, there has to be that belief. There has to be a sense of worthiness. If you believe that you deserve to be punished, the universe can be as generous as you want with the punishment. So that sense of worthiness it's like, depending on where someone is starting from, I know for me, and this is something Gigi helped me connect, is like my sense of worthiness had to come like two years along in terms of investing in just my sense of worthiness, just my self-esteem needed to come up before I was ever ready to really step into shadow work. So it it is something that's kind of a process. So beyond a sense of worthiness, all you need is willingness a willingness to face things about yourself that, I mean, pleasant things don't end up in our shadow. When we look at our shadow, it probably hurts. It probably is painful. I know the first step of healing my shadow around jealousy, for example, was recognizing that my partner who was causing me to be jealous was just a mirror for energy that I was already carrying. And that is a painful truth. <laughs> to recognize when you have a lifetime of relationships that have all been making me jealous and it's all their fault. And to really heal that and kind of turn that corner, the first step was to swallow the pill that says, this is mine. This is my issue. And they're just reflecting it to me. So not everybody's ready or willing to swallow that pill. And if you're not, you're not going to get very far in shadow work because Shadow work doesn't change anybody else. It changes us and how we see ourselves. So that is a little bit about the space of shadow work. Um, I come in here, hopefully you can tell, with an open heart to share my experience and my passion and calling to facilitate conversations like this one, where we can face our shadows with immense unconditional love for ourselves and 
genuinely move our energy to see ourselves in a more whole version where again those those little fragments of ourselves that we haven't heard in years decades maybe since we were tiny they get to come back and they get to have a seat at the table and they get to vote on your decisions and who you are in the world how you show up in your daily life um bringing those pieces, letting them come out of the shadow and back into your wholeness. It's a powerful transformation towards being who your soul came here to be. So um, are there any thoughts or questions or reactions before we move on, um, just in terms of shadow work in general? And if not, that's okay. Wonderful. So Hopefully that means you guys are right there with me as far as the power and the beauty of loving our shadow pieces. Um, it's not easy. It's not exactly happy-go-lucky type work, um, but the outcome is definitely warm and fuzzy. When you reach a place of loving yourself more fully, that part is, it just makes the whole journey worth it. So, um, I want to spend the next little bit talking about how did our shadow get there? So this is something that also it applies to everybody. I think the same process happens to all of us. And to really answer that question, we have to take a step back before you were born. And again, this is all my own foundation of belief. If it doesn't resonate, that's cool. But reincarnation. So our soul's eternal journey through lifetimes. So that produces karma, meaning we make mistakes, we do good things. It all balances out in our eternal soul's karmic debt in this world. And when we come forward into this life, we have our entire natal chart. You know, I personally believe that we chose our starting point, meaning we chose the day we were born. We chose the time. We chose the family that we came to work with. And we knew all of that was going to give us what we needed to live whatever mission our soul was coming forward to live. So when we're young, in our early life, our family that we chose is set up perfectly to push our buttons and trigger the healing, the beginning of the healing that our soul was coming forward to conduct. Every single lifetime that we live is for healing. It's for spiritual evolution of our soul. So healing the old wounds, finding new territory of being whole and full within ourselves, within the limitations of this physical world. So sometimes I get going faster than I think my energy can keep up with. So when we are in early childhood, basically what I'm saying is the people that are there who make the biggest impacts on us, we chose them. And we chose them because of the way that they would oppress us, the way that they would reject us, the way that they would be incapable of loving us the way that we needed to be loved. We chose them because we wanted to set ourselves up with these manifestations that would begin the healing process. You know, like, and there, as we get into examples, my goal is always to shine a light on that whole evolution. You know, you come and you don't feel like you fit in your family. Like you just are, how am I related to you people? Do you ever, anybody ever feel like that? Um, again, just me. But when that happens, it's so painful. It's so uncomfortable for however many years. And you think, why would I ever choose this? Why would I ever choose to not fit in my family? It's been so hard. What it does is set you up to be in a position to seek your real family, your soul level family. So not having that connection in early life, because you were missing it, you went out and found something that was even better, even more aligned with who your soul was coming to find, coming to be you found your soul family because you were missing a biological family. So there's always that other end of what the shadow can eventually become. And in the middle of that is our sense of worthiness and our willingness. So that is all it takes to make that transformation from 
people don't understand me or my family doesn't understand me to I have the best friends in the entire world. These people are my soulmates. They, I have a whole community of like-minded people to turn to when I need them. You build it for yourself and you aren't the only one that benefits from that, from you finding your soul family. Everybody in that soul family comes together and they probably all have a lot of the same shadows with like not fitting into their family of origin. So that's just one example of kind of how the whole life cycle can go from trauma is basically the word for it in our childhood to we chose that for a reason because we wanted the healed version and you can't have the healed version if you don't start with the wound so the early childhood piece is another part that kind of puts people off of shadow work because they're like i lived through it and i don't want to go back and it's like yeah but you probably have to because that's where all the the little pieces got chipped away of who you really are and you built a foundation from that place of an incomplete self. And so to rework your whole foundation, you got to go back to childhood and recollect all those pieces. So there's a lot of inner child work and reparenting yourself and those kinds of things that, you know, even going so far as to say grieving the parents that you didn't have, the parents that you probably deserved, uh, you always deserve them, but that you didn't have. And the knowledge that helps me there is realizing that I chose this. I wanted the healed version, and that means you start with the wound. So those are some of my perspectives as far as how the shadow gets there in the first place. Um, I think it has so much to do with the healing that our soul intended before we ever came. And hopefully that helps us to further make peace with the shadow part, the hard part, the pain part that's like, yeah, to get to the healing, like you go through the pain of the wound and eventually it culminates in healing and healed self. So I think, let me check my notes here and see if there's ever anything else. I think that's pretty good. I think let's get into specific charts. Uh, Gigi, do you want to go first? If someone has a pressing desire to go first, that's fine with me. Yeah, I'm open. Everybody cool? The Gigi going first. Seems like, seems like we're all cool. Um, okay, so I am going to share my screen. Ariel's cool. Okay, so here is... Gigi's chart. And before I get into the pieces that we're going to look at today, I do want to say, kind of going back to what we already established in every single lifetime that we come forward for is about healing and evolution of our soul. And so really any, any piece of the chart could technically be said to be part of your shadow. Like there's a beginning frequency that you come in and you're operating here. And then there's like a light frequency that you get to that happens with basically every zodiac energy, every planet, there's an evolution. So to go into specific shadows for each person, it isn't as cookie cutter as like these four pieces are your shadow. It's like, you know, we're going to start with those and that'll guide us into the rest of the chart as we try to put together the face of each person's shadow. And more than its face, it's voice because it's talking to you, whether you realize it or not. It sounds like your voice because it is, but it says mean things. It doesn't ever say nice things to you. Anything that you say to yourself that hurts your own feelings, that's your shadow talking to you. And probably that voice and the things that it says they aren't your thoughts. They were something that somebody said to you when you were small. And you've kept that on repeat then from your subconscious, from your shadow self. So again, this is where we, we start with these basic pieces. And then we will, for everybody, kind of go feel our way through the rest of the chart to see how we can put it all together. So I'll use Gigi's chart here to demonstrate the few pieces that we're going to start with. Um, and there's, yes, the first one is the fourth house. 
And in the chart that is always beginning with this IC line, the bottom of your midheaven is the beginning of the fourth house. And our fourth house represents home and our foundation, our family of origin, specifically our mother. Um, when we look at the fourth house, what that's telling us is the energy that you were born into, basically. So if you have planets in the fourth house, which she does, um, that signals karma in the fourth house. So related to those concepts of family and your mom and your emotional connection to home and your sense of having a home where you are totally free to be yourself. So the reason that this one is important is basically the fourth house shows the energy that your parents reflected to you as this is who you are. And your parents telling you who you are is powerful stuff. When you're small and you know nothing about the world, who they say you are, you think that, I mean, that just must be what it is. They, they know, they're adults, they know everything. Now that we're adults, we know they knew nothing. They're just, you know, playing it off the cuff and imprinting on our subconscious for the rest of our life. So as we look at her fourth house here, she's got Mercury in Sagittarius, and then Chiron and the sun in Capricorn. So to kind of unpack that shadow is unpacking each one of those pieces. Um, but right off the bat, just at the point of like, you know, fourth house planets signal karma in both your family of our origin and the family that you will later go on to create. Um, and I don't want to share on Gigi's behalf. So I'll ask her if there's anything that you want to share around. <laughs> like so far, we've already narrowed your shadow to that part of it. Um, part of your shadow is that side of it. Does that, I guess, like what comes up with that? Well, that's a question that I don't know how to answer. What comes up with that? With Mercury, Chiron, and Sun. Um, I'm not getting the connection. In other words, I, I do have the, the energy of my parents talking to me, telling me who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that relates to each one of those in there. So the Mercury in Sag is very interesting. Plus your IC is in Sag. So that Sag energy rules your entire fourth house. So as far as like who your parents saw you to be um, and who they reacted to in your energy was that Sagittarius and probably extra because Mercury represents our communication. So your communication was also in that Sagittarius energy. And so as we look at that, it's about understanding what is the shadow frequency of Sagittarius. Um, like the bad rap that Sagittarius gets when they're in their shadow is that they are blunt and too outspoken, that they don't consider other people's feelings before they speak. Um, so ruffling people's feathers and being maybe even what others would perceive as disrespectful because you're speaking truth. You're telling the truth as you see it regardless of what other people think about that. And I only can imagine that, especially for a girl, that's a very masculine energy, Sagittarius in general. It's so assertive of your view of the world, like your version of the truth. And then Mercury is like, you just put it right out there. You just, mm, here's, here's the truth. And like we were talking about before, most people don't want the truth. So I would imagine that some of that is probably hard to tell apart from the general conditioning women were receiving at that time, where you should be quiet, <laughs> you should be listening and seen and not heard. And I, I'm making all of this up. I don't know. You tell me. But okay. your voice is right there. And 
<laughs> between that and the Chiron and Capricorn, which basically Capricorn is like the divine father energy and Chiron and Capricorn means that there was basically never a genuine sense of approval from either your father or whoever the authority figure for you in that space was. And because we're in the fourth house, it also is about the mom. So it's like your parents in general never saw who you were, like your authentic self. And if they did, they didn't approve. So that's that's like the, um, the textbook version. And just to add the sun onto that, when you have the sun in the fourth house, you think I'm gonna be really good at home and family and all of that. But again, the evolutionary process, and especially when you have Chiron right next to it, is first your home and your family is so painful. And it's so painful that it inspires you to build your own version that does feel good to you. But it first requires like a good deal of doing what doesn't work for you. Okay, I have a question about the sun and Chiron. And I want to make sure I'm understanding that the sun in Chiron in the fourth house would automatically make my childhood painful because of those two Chiron and the sun in my fourth house. Am I understanding that correctly? I mean, as far as my opinion goes, everybody had pain in their childhood for one okay. and two Chiron in the fourth is like a disruption between you and your mom. Like they're, the bond is broken and Chiron and Capricorn is the bond between you and your dad. So uh, it's like, okay. there's a lack of approval. And there's, okay. when, there's an, when there's a lack of approval, which you may or may not resonate with that piece, um, even more so it has us scraping off all the pieces that are being disapproved of so that we can get to that sense of approval from other people. And eventually the long version of the evolution is that you no longer need that, that you have your own internal sense of home where your safety is something that you cultivate for yourself and you don't necessarily rely on other people or let other people pull you out of that. Okay, um, thank you, Carly. So yeah. here's where I am with that. I am only now coming into the level of self-trust, self-worth, and self-understanding that I am now allowing myself to create a new home life for myself now. I mean, we're talking a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was born in 1953. That's a long time. That's way too long. But I just, I haven't known about shadow work. I don't know, maybe I don't know, five years, 10 years, I don't know, but I'm ready now to get into it. So going back to, to help you understand what you said and where I am with it, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, first, I'm going to say something that I have a question about and I'm, or let me just tell you, not question, let me just tell you, I feel that Mercury at 29 degrees of Sag is not carrying much of Sag, but it's carrying a ton of Capricorn. And I say that because the Sag being too outspoken, blunt, never. I didn't, and you mentioned the word voice. I never even had a voice. I couldn't even use it. I didn't even own one. So that part I cannot resonate with. But if you take that in addition to another aspect of the um, shadow side of Sag is that I don't consider other people's feelings. Okay, now that played a giant role, but it was reversed. And I'm telling you this, because I think this is really important because the depth of what I'm getting from what you're explaining is that my mother felt that I didn't consider her feelings the entire time she, she died when I was 31. So for 31 years, she felt that I never considered her feelings because she expected me to do everything for her, be her caretaker, be everything to her and for her. Because my father died when I was 12. So I was the only one she had, being mm -hmm. an only child. So she'd tell me that I was being 
so selfish. I heard that all the time. If I ever wanted to do anything like a weekend outing with a friend or something, I didn't consider how she was feeling and she needed me. So that is like, yes, indeed so. And that's mm -hmm. coming from Sag. Okay, yes. Um, now, looking at Chiron and the sun, never a sense of approval from parent. Um, they did not see my authentic self absolutely positively they didn't even see me at all <laughs> so sun in Cappy also there so painful that i had to build my own solidity if you will or safety because i never had it there was no solid foundation for me ever that resonates too so to boil it all down <clears throat> it all resonates very, very clearly. So I got it. I don't have any further questions on that aspect of what those are doing in my fourth house. It's like, it's just, okay. It's a confirmation of what I already knew. Yes. And yeah, by the time you see your shadow clearly, you realize, wow, this has been infiltrating like everything my whole life. Like it's not as dark and mysterious as it sounds in the very beginning mm -hmm. um and you know because we're talking about chiron in this case because it happens to be in your fourth house that's the wounded healer and the whole point is the medicine that you get good at making because of the pain that you have endured and then you're able to help people who have similar pain to feel like they have a place of safety in the world you know, like you've had to make it for yourself because it wasn't given to you. And that Chiron medicine paying it forward is now you can teach other people how to build it for themselves too. There's something else I want to add, which you mentioned when you were explaining, and that is it's uh, perhaps not just your family of origin, but any family um, dynamics you may have for your entire life. So I right. do want to, this is, this, I'm glad it's coming up because this is big. I want to say that it's the same thing in my own family, which now is non-existent, but having a husband and two children, it was the same. Um, they certainly did not see my authentic self because I didn't know who my authentic self was. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. the pain of having to build my own, I couldn't. I didn't know how to build my own family of origin, of course, because I was just a, a child, but I also didn't know how to build my own solid family of my husband and my two children because I didn't know my authentic self. So I'm telling, I'm saying this because I think this is of utmost importance. And I'm going to say the impact this is making on me now is instead of it looking like an unsurmountable or insurmountable uh, mountain to climb to do this, I'm realizing, okay, these were the reasons why I couldn't feel safe. I couldn't feel wanted. I couldn't feel appreciated in my family environments because of this. I really feel that to be true in the depth of who I am, that's it. But now I can. And so my shadow work now, instead of looking like it would be really difficult, I'm really so ready to embrace it more. I've embraced it some myself since I saw your first video, Carly, which I think was only a week ago, maybe two. Exactly. That embraced, that impacted me that I decided to start working on my own. So this is surprising me. What I'm saying is surprising me, but I'm glad I'm able to share this with you and the other people in the group because I'm not afraid of it anymore. I, I'm determined that now, since I am getting in touch with my authentic self, I've got a chance of having a happy life. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, that is all so good. Um, and that is one of my favorite takeaways from basically anyone that I've ever done shadow work with that they end up realizing I've already done a lot of shadow work. 
like I've already healed a lot of the things that were standing in my way. They were holding me back, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and you've already come so far. And again, that's the cool thing about shadow work is that it is a process of deepening our self-love. And even in this conversation, it's like nothing has changed. You know, you're still sitting in the same spot you were, but you see your own progress more clearly. And you're able to give yourself credit for overcoming painful things. Chiron in our chart, no matter where it is, like it'll be painful to get through it. And when it's in your family of origin, you're just so born into it that like you said about not having a voice, like you didn't own one. I can, I got to think that that has something to do with Chiron and Mercury sharing the same house. Um, okay. Because Mercury and Sag, like even when it's in the fourth house, I would think your voice, your truth, your version of the truth is clear. Like it's clearer than most people's, I would imagine. And releasing that out into the world is a whole nother question. So yeah, just something to kind of play with there because it sounds like, you know, when we say I didn't own one, it's like, well, yeah, but everyone owns one, but you're also not conscious until age three, four or five that you can even remember. So what you're saying, what I'm hearing is that your parents had already extinguished your voice by the time you could remember. They had already done away with that. So you've had no conscious adulthood of like really owning your voice and bringing your truth forward. So that would be in the realm of shadow work, like how to continue finding your voice and tuning in to what you have to say. Because Sagittarius Mercury always has something to say, something really important. So sharing your truth with the world like that, that was supposed to happen. And that's what I'm talking about. Like it gets put, put on pause or something. Like when stuff goes in our shadow, it's like, like a time capsule almost. Like you are intentionally going without it for a certain amount of time so that when it comes back online, it has a different effect. Like, I don't know. That's, it's hard to explain without your own personal example. Mm -hmm. So that is the fourth house. That's where our parents and our family of origin reflects who they perceive us to be. And those messages that they give us in that space, like we're talking about, that starts when we're a baby. So remembering who they told us we were, it's probably so normal and so natural that it's really hard to see there. Where it gets clearer is when we move up to here, in our descendant and the opening of our seventh house, this is where our romantic relationships and any business partnerships that we enter into continue to reflect our shadow to us. And Gigi's is very interesting because she also has uh, Mars and Venus in Pisces in the sixth house. Um, so she identifies with Pisces a lot. And by definition, your descendant is somewhat hidden from you. And so we attract people of that descendant energy so that they can reflect it to us because that descendant energy is often misplaced inside of us. And we need other people to reflect it so we can find it and ground into it. But hers, I mean, she's got these other planets in Pisces. And so she already really resonates with it. So I do wonder though, kind of since you brought your husband into it, um, Pisces in a relationship, like a Pisces descendant is of service to the relationship. And that's really nice. And to be on the receiving end of it is a dream. But in the long run, if you're not, and this is where most people have to go through this part first, it's like in the long run, you feel like a slave you feel confined and expected to be of service. And like, that's your whole role in the relationship is to be of service. And again, they're not seeing your authentic self. They're not connecting with you and your soul. So like that part, you know, I know enough of your story to kind of piece it together. It's interesting because you do so resonate with Pisces, but also the Pisces shadow seems to also have its part like from your marriage. And with no other planets in your seventh house, that's 
the Pisces descendant is pretty much all we have to look at. And then it is just a matter of, again, looking at the shadow side of Pisces. And that is that you can wind up the martyr or resentful because you've given and given and given and given and been of service to everyone. And then you don't feel like anybody ever came back and took care of you, Um, (laughs) which that's kind of true of Pisces energy and Virgo energy for that matter, anywhere in the chart for any of us, we can become too service oriented and forget about ourselves. And that will never end well in the grand scheme of things. So the next one is the eighth house and the eighth house is ruled by Scorpio. Um, and it's the territory of emotional intimacy and shared resources. So think about shared resources in the sense of way back in the day, cavemen and cave women, and they killed an animal and they brought it back and now they have it. And they're sharing those resources. Both people's survival depends on this one resource that two people are sharing. That is a very intimate situation. There is a lot of trust required in the other person that you're not going to steal the whole carcass and go run away with it. Like you're going to let me have some. Um, That's where the trust and the deep intimacy comes into play in this eighth house space. Um, And for, for, Gigi, she's got her cusp of the eighth house in Aries and her Jupiter in Taurus in the eighth house. Also that Jupiter is part of this grand trine that is part of her kite. So her earth grand trine is like really kind of the center focusing part of her energy. And that includes her Jupiter in the eighth house, which Jupiter by itself signals expansion and any type of expansion. So whether that's financial or emotional or spiritual, all different kinds of expansion. And so I'm just feeling my way into this. And this is where, you know, shadow work and working with your chart in your shadow work is a lifelong process. But Jupiter in the eighth house means that your opportunities for expansion will come through deeply intimate situations where in order to receive your abundance, you have to reveal yourself. That's the key to intimacy. It's not one-sided. Like the person on the other side can go super deep and give you what you need. You have to go super deep in order to get the abundance that exists in that deeply intimate place. Um, So I wonder how that lands in general, the Jupiter in the eighth house piece. Oh, I just, I just want to say, what? (laughs) That's perfect. And that's because I see myself, and you've already mentioned this, identifying a great deal with Pisces. And for that, that's the intimacy. That's the ability to be intimate, not be intimate, but to live in deep intimacy. That's who I am. That's where I live. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I find very few people who can meet me there. And that's an extremely lonely place to be. Mm -hmm. So the expansion of the deep intimacy and the trust has been occurring forever (laughs) because I am like it's so deep and it's amazing that it is the Jupiter in Taurus because it's almost like a joke is what I'm saying it's almost like I have this to offer according to what my chart's telling me but there's no taker there's <laughs> no takers I'm offering it it's me it's who I am there's there are no takers and that's where the joke comes in like the joke is like it's 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 sadistic (laughs) which is terrible to say but it's true I'm just telling you the truth well and I do I'm so glad you offered that because it helps me pull these pieces together because the eighth house is ruled by Scorpio and here you have Aries on the front cusp and you have Taurus taking up the rest of it so it's a water house 
ruled by a very intensely water sign and you have fire and earth. So I get your inclination, especially with your Pisces descendant to want to connect through water. But what I'm piecing together as you talk is that actually the pathway to that intimacy to get into your eighth house is Aries, which is not water, it's fire. And it's not just any fire, it's the raw, pure, physical life spark that is you. And you embodying that is the doorway into the eighth house. So you're not meant to be of service to your partner. You're meant to roar as like the warrior that you were born to be and the taker will find her. So you're coming to it from like this, you know, the, the taker eventually will get the benefit of your Pisces descendant. You know, you will live in deep intimacy with them and that will be fine, but that's not, I, I do think that there's something to be said about you really can't get what's in this house if you don't embody these two energies. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, I can the earth with no problem. That I can identify with. I've got tons of earth. The fire, not so much. That's where I'm lacking. And well, I and like, whole chart. even the earth, um, Taurus, the highest frequency of Taurus, and especially like what we were talking about with Jupiter and Taurus, it's a matter of complete inner peace and stillness. Okay. So your mind is no longer going at all and your body is breathing slowly. Your heartbeat is barely moving because you're so at rest. And okay. that is the highest frequency of Taurus. And your Virgo energy probably makes it a little difficult <laughs> to dip down in that restful place of Taurus. So again, these two energies of Aries, like roaring with the spark of your own divine life and Taurus embodying total calm, that that is how you come to the place of the intimacy that you're built for. And yeah, that's, that's interesting. So intimacy in my life is the number one word emotional intimacy though that's what i say emotional intimacy is my number one term okay that's what that's what i want most in my life that's what i don't have that's what i've never had i have a scorpio friend female she and i are able to share emotional intimacy with each other because we understand each other so i'm going back to aries which i've always avoided my entire life i've avoided aries people and um i want to know what you're saying is it possible for me to consider looking in the direction of aries people and embracing them and bringing them into my life so yeah like i would say that is a good takeaway from this shadow work session that's a piece of okay. especially when there's an energy that you know rubs you the wrong way probably yeah. that's like assignment number one where you should be going and learning to pull that back into yourself so okay. the rubbing you the wrong way part is just the invitation to step into relationship with that part of you you're not rejecting them you're rejecting yourself they don't rub you the wrong way you when you're like that are rubbing yourself the wrong way so that's where the deepening of the self-love comes in you need to learn to love your aries energy and as you do, as you're able to embody that, look at how much of your seventh house, the house of relationships, committed partnerships, 65% of your house is Aries. So how are you going to have a big, fulfilling, all the things relationship if that's not part of your energy that you're carrying around? I didn't know that, Carly. And I thank you for telling me this. Mm. I mean, I know, know my chart, but I didn't know what that meant until you just explained it to me. Well, and that's my take on it is like, it really does take both to like get into the house. You need the energy on the cusp, but to fully explore what you're meant to explore and evolve in each house and each life area. I genuinely believe that it takes every single degree and minute of the house. Every piece of energy that's in there is part of the terrain of working with that area of your life. So for you, relationships is a big chunk, Aries. And, you know, ultimately the goal is to integrate all 12 
of the signs back into our whole. Um, but this is the shadow work process of realizing Aries. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that does rub me the wrong way. And it seems to be important to get into this eighth house place of deep intimacy. Um, so maybe I look at that. Maybe I try to study like Aries and what is the light frequency and what's the whole point? What's the point of Aries? I mean, it really is our spark of life. It's like, that's, that's the first, it's the first zodiac sign. It's spring. It's the cardinal spring energy of life coming forward to be lived. There's so much passion in Aries. Like, I mean, this much a little bit jealous of your like Aries in the eighth house. Like that's probably steamy by the time like an eighth house is a water house. And then you put fire energy there that makes steam. And that's enjoyable <laughs> when you end up getting it right. So the Aries energy is not to be shunned. It's part, it's part of the whole and each, all of us have it. It's just a matter of where it is. And for you, it happens to be sitting in this seventh, eighth house place around relationships. So that's the cool thing about shadow work is it's all just questions, all just like, how does that resonate? And how does this resonate? And it seems like that Aries piece is something that you can take away and be with and hold it with curiosity and see what comes out of it. Thank you, Carla. Mm, of course, of course, of course. Um, okay, so the last house that I will point us to, again, with the huge disclaimer that all the houses and all the planets could be part of the shadow, but hers are just really organized so that they all happen to land in these, in these houses. Um, so the 12th house, this is, the 12th house is always the hardest one to explain in words because the basic concept is that it represents non-physical energy. It represents collective consciousness. So trying to break that down into words is obviously very difficult. And planets in the 12th house, you can see she's got the moon and Pluto. Those are both very powerful ones to have there. Um, it means that your relationship with collective consciousness will have a transformative effect. That's true of 12th house planets regardless. And especially she's got Pluto. Pluto represents a soul transformation no matter where it's at in your chart. And the 12th house placement of her Pluto says that her soul's transformation, kind of like what we were talking about with Mars Pisces, Gigi, your soul's transformation is integrated into the transformation of the collective. They are the same thing. So you cannot evolve your soul without also benefiting the collective. Um, so like your work to heal is literally healing the collective. So that is, oh, I just, I love that thought. Um, what was that sentence did you say? You, the something way. along the lines of you can't heal yourself without also healing the collective. Okay. I think that was it. Something along those that lines. That resonates perfectly with me. Yeah. Well, and you have these, these sixth house Pisces planets which also, I mean, between your 12th house planets and your sixth house planets, you have really anchored your energy in a place of being of service. So whatever you do, as you lean into your soul's purpose and even your Aries energy, it is only going to more dramatically guide you in the direction of being of service in the way that you truly intended to be of service. Nothing will ever take you off that path. Um, so that's really encouraging. You know, the more you become your real self, the more of service you will be to the collective. Any sixth or 12th house planets, I feel like kind of point us in that direction. Um, so I think that's most of what I wanted to say about the 12th house. I do also want to leave you with one more piece about your fire energy. So your IC is here in Sag, which doesn't show up on this little chart. So like, it looks like you have less, didn't mean to click that. Um, but you have the IC in Sag and then South Node in, and Pluto in Leo, and then Aries as part of your relationship energy. No planets there though. Um, that's a lot. That's, that's actually a lot of fire energy. 
And it feels a little bit like I'm going to be poking at your shadow when I tell you that you do have fire energy inside of you and that maybe saying that you don't makes it easier to deny your own fire impulses. So like saying that I don't have a, I don't have enough fire. That's why I'm not outspoken or that's why I don't create or that's why I don't put my art out into the world. But you, you have a lot. And actually Pluto and Leo is a very interesting story. Pluto moves so slowly that it's a generational planet. So people born, I mean, you're towards the end of the Pluto in Leo generation. Um, but they were born into parents who only saw the value of hard work, creative expression. There was no time. There was no time for that. It was frivolous and wasteful and a waste of your time. You could be working and making money or doing something productive, being a contributing member of society, art and play and creative freedom and all of those things were just luxuries that you did not have in childhood because your parents did not afford them to you. So Pluto and Leo, it's about starting off with no self-expression allowed and eventually finding your way to your own personal self-expression, whatever that looks like. And because your Pluto's in the 12th house, as you find your self-expression, it will ripple out into the collective. That's just the way the energy is wired. So it's really for the good of everyone that you tap in to your fire energy and release it more <laughs> into the world. Um, scary. I know I'm doing the same thing. I'm working with my Aries energy very intentionally right now and tapping into my Mars, like we talked about, like I really do have to see myself and my fire energy in terms of how it is of service to the collective. And that is what gives me the courage to put myself out there because I know it will ripple out into the collective energy. Um, but that's still scary and it's a process. And what else are we doing? Like we might as well be improving bit by bit. So yes, your fire energy, it's in there. I got it. Thank okay, you. good. <laughs> very helpful. Very, very helpful. <laughs> I am so glad. There are, I mean, like I said, every single planet in here is its own evolutionary journey. So every single piece could be contributing to your shadow. So these four houses that we've started with are by no means exhaustive, but the, the the nice thing about shadow work is that all the shadow is there and it's not going anywhere. So even if you only take one little piece and kind of unpack it and start untangling this one little piece, when the next piece is ready to be untangled, it'll present itself. Either life will tell you or you'll get an idea or you'll wake up in the middle of the night and you won't be able to think about anything besides Jupiter in the eighth house. And it'll be like, I there's something in there. I got to go look at it. So just let it, let it unfold. Take the piece that feels the most accessible and start there always. So. I shall. Nice. Oh, thank you so much for requesting this. So I have 30 more minutes on the calendar as far as if we want to use that time, we can. So Ariel and Christy, I am more than happy to pull up your charts if you would like. It is not required. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I'm okay with you doing mine. Do you still have it from, I mean, it was a long time ago that I gave you my info. I may, or I may not. So we will, we'll take a look and we'll see. Is it there this one? Yep. So we'll just kind of run around the areas the same as we, oh my, no, we won't. Um, wow. So this is what I'm saying. Like you look at each individual chart and the recipe just goes right out the window because where we need to go in yours is this first house. Um, okay. And the first house opposite this north node and pluto in this intercept that wow. no but that's hard 
this is hard. Yeah. This is a hard configuration of energy. It's challenging. It's like um, advanced level lessons that you came to practice. Um, oh. So yeah, yeah right. Like I'm taking baby steps with my shadow work right now. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. I'm like, I've, been, I've known about shadow work for about two years, mm. and I, I, I. I'm trying really hard to sit with things when they come up and yes. I am still kind of stuck on the making sure that I'm loving it because there's still a part of me that's trying to separate from that, that, that stuff that I think is bad. And, and I, I realize that it's a part of me and it needs to be accepted, but there's still a lot of me that is like, because <gasps> I find if, if something comes up and I try to sit with it, I have a tendency to move on to find something that I'm like, like the last time something came up, I had a friend that, that I'm like, oh my God, I recognize this. And I started sitting with it and it just went and disappeared because I was so excited for actually having the self-awareness of it that, that I didn't end up sitting with it. So. Well, and <laughs> Yeah. It, it's a work in progress all the time. You know, the, my favorite thing to impart to people about shadow work is letting it come to you. So when you're all excited and you have this new awareness and then it's gone, probably for the best, probably the best possible thing. <laughs> like that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. I got what I needed out of that right now and let it go. And when it comes back, when you have a dream or somebody says something and it pops it back up to the, the surface, like let it come back and let it be there while it's there. And when it goes, let it go because nobody's trying to do shadow work a hundred percent of the time, all the time. That would be miserable, right? Sitting with things is, it can be so painful. And so if it doesn't stick around for you to be able to sit with it, mm -hmm. I'd say it's just like, not the right time to go any deeper with that. I got, I got the level that I needed for today. And when it comes back, it'll be the next level. And when it comes back, it'll be the next level for the rest of your life, probably. So there's no rush. There's no rush to like get to the bottom of it and figure it all out. So there's that piece. The other piece is your Pisces rising. So my partner is also a Pisces rising and I love you people, but I do get the, the, urge to escape of like just turn away from anything that is even remotely uncomfortable because on a deep level you do know that your soul feels good like you do know that you should feel good in the world and so the the human plane the earth plane is riddled with obstacles that pop up and they don't feel good when we run into them and Pisces knows on this deep soul level that I should feel good and so they escape they escape from things that don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And so bringing it back, <laughs> you know, like letting it come back one little piece at a time, like it's all good. The other piece that I, I look at, as you say, like I get distracted, you have Jupiter in Gemini. And basically that is, again, a soul level commitment to never be bored, like sticking with mm -hmm. things and follow through and get to the end and become a master and on and on like probably not you know like probably you'll be I actually heard um the full phrase the other day I'd never heard it before I've heard the thing you know jack of all trades master of none okay yeah, well that's not the whole saying and uh, people have used that against me my whole life because I also like to bounce around to different things the whole saying is actually Jack of all trades, master of none, but always better than one. So you're not the master of one thing, but you have a depth of knowledge on lots of things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like here we're already into shadow work. If the whole point is to see ourselves with more loving eyes, embracing your curiosity and your lack of follow through, your desire to bounce around to different subjects is probably in your shadow. You know, people have probably told you you're inconsistent and you should finish the things that you start and yada, yada, yada. So those kinds of reflections can end up in your shadow, making you feel like your curiosity is hurting you instead of helping you. 
And so Jupiter, especially in Gemini, Jupiter is your expansion, all forms of expansion, spiritual, financial, abundance in all forms. And yours is in Gemini. So that means like the path to your abundance is through your curiosity, through your learning, through your divine willingness to be open and ask questions and sponge up new information. And who knows what happens after you learn all the things, the way that you put the pieces together now that you've spent time studying all these random subjects. Um, So embracing that, like that's already into the shadow where, you know, your curiosity will help guide the way. It's like a flashlight shining ahead on the path. And if you're rejecting your natural curiosity, then the path is dark and, you know, can't see where to go next. So how does all that feel so far? I, I, I watch a lot of different types of podcasts and but they'll have these multitudes of different things in there that you can go into and I'll go and I'll put them on a list and some of them will sit there for years and some of them I'm just like it resonates and I go and I go and I get that and I get tidbits from that information and Mm -hmm. then I move on to something else and it and that this makes a lot of sense yeah I I don't feel like an expert in anything but it's so weird how something that I get into that stuck with me ends up being a way to help somebody else. It comes up just out of the blue when I am talking with somebody about something. Well, have you tried this? I'm working on right now, trying to make sure people are wanting that advice before I give it. That, that, that's, that's, um, that's been kind of my things. I, I have a tendency to, to give unwanted advice when, when, somebody may just be wanting me to listen instead of holding that space. And so that, that has been something that I have been working on lately is making sure that I'm, I am present for people in the way that they're wanting me to be present. So yeah, it's, it's been really cool. I mean, I've come a long way in the last couple of years. No doubt. I mean, the astrology side of things, this is something that I want to get more into. I'm, I'm still a baby. I've been working on Enneagram a lot lately and Mm -hmm. and trying to find out where I am and what are some of the traumas that shaped me. And it, you know, it's, I feel like it's one of the more complex personality typing systems, but the astrology stuff, this is like Like a whole nother level. It's a language for obviously a language from another planet at this point but agreed there's so many things to learn and associate with it's the whole system no doubt about it yeah um so i feel like i i do need to come back to this the first and seventh house um so the, I think the reason that I want to talk about it is because I have a very similar configuration with my Aries energy, where mm-hmm. you see you have a Pisces rising. So that's the beginning of your first house. And then your mm-hmm. second house starts in Taurus. So that means Aries isn't on the cusp of any of the houses. So you see like it is completely in the middle of your first house. And Mm -hmm. you can read that like it's submerged. It's like pushed down and it belongs. This is the part that I've only recently come to. It belongs to Pisces. It's like Aries isn't its own energy with the way it is in your chart here. It's like down below and Pisces is the surface. Pisces is the opening to your first house. And then Aries is down here. So by the time Aries comes up out, it's wrapped in Pisces. They're like together as one thing. So as you're talking about being there for people and being present for people, um, that's Pisces, the ability to listen and to feel into like, where is this person? And then Pisces is also responsible for like being of service to the collective in the way that they need you to be of service. And then your Aries energy is part of that. So it's like your Pisces is like supercharged. 
compared to most people's Pisces energy, because yours also mm -hmm. includes all of this Aries energy. So when you go to be of service, it's a very powerful expression that may, like you said, like maybe not everybody's ready for that because as you come with your self-expression, it's like, I am of service, but it also has like this huge Aries energy behind it, this engine of life force behind it. And it's like, it probably is like a tidal wave of energy moving over people. Um, how does that? Intimidating a lot. It was? Because I'm, I've been told I'm intimidating a lot. And that, that makes sense because if I'm, if I'm trying to be helpful and I'm potentially bringing something to our, their awareness that they're in no way ready to recognize, I can see how that's massively intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where, you know, this level of awareness helps us to understand the reflections that we've gotten so far. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, yeah, I can see why people think I'm intimidating. I have a lot of Aries energy right up in your face, like right when you meet me. But here's the thing, you came with that energy on purpose, in my opinion. We chose our starting point, we chose it all. So you made it like this. And that, you know, accepting that is maybe a lifelong process, but I do think that there are people in this world who will think your energy is perfect, mm. you know, like your style of however you approach life and you put yourself out there and you express yourself, you make your offering of service into the world. Some people are going to resonate with exactly the way you do it. They're going to say, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my whole life because it's your authentic expression. And it's not going to be for everybody. Like that's right. just part of that. Um, this is also kind of taking us off track of the recipe that I just gave you, but we look at Saturn. Saturn is uh -huh. its own evolution and you have Saturn in Leo. And the short version of that is that Saturn wants you to learn that your expression is for you. It's not for anybody else your creative authenticity, your creative expression out into the world is for the satisfaction of doing it. You're making art because it's fun to make art, not what people think. And chances are with Saturn and Leo, you're gonna go through the first part of people not being a fan of what you're doing. And the point is don't let that stop you. Keep doing it because pushing through, you will find the right audience who resonates so deeply with what you're doing, but you wouldn't have found them if you were only doing it for the reaction because the first reaction has to be bad. So it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be difficult, but the end, the part at the end is you find your authentic audience. You find people who resonate with exactly who you are. And all the people who ever said your energy's wrong or it's too much or it's intimidating or whatever, they just weren't the right audience. They just weren't the right, people on the receiving end of it and that's okay and that's where discernment like what you said like you're practicing only giving it when it's the right time when it's the right, right setting the right person maybe they did ask for it specifically you know all of those things setting yourself up to keep your wisdom to yourself unless somebody specifically wants to know what you know and express it in ways that feel authentic like I have a I have a, a desire to help that's very strong and I can be guilty of smothering people with my help. Like they're like, get off me. I don't need your help. I don't want your help. Um, and so I channel all this extra helper energy that I have into making YouTube videos, into making podcasts, because it's me offering my help out into the world without needing a specific person to be the receiver of my help. So it kind of takes other people out of the equation and lets you just offer what feels good to you. And then it doesn't really matter if people like it or not because you had fun making it. So all of that kind of wraps together, I think, in your shadow, depending on where you're at with all of those pieces.
Yeah, it, it took me a long time to, to get to the point that I wasn't just like, well, you should. I was shooting a lot of people, a lot yeah. of shooting going on. And, yeah. and now I, you know, even, even my sister, you know, it, growing up, she was always very reserved and easy, easy to take advantage of. And I was, an, I, I was shooting on her a ton. And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in our personal growth over the years, she has finally gotten to the point where she, she has the ability to tell me that I need to stop shooting on her. Oh, and good. sometimes yeah. it's, just, it's just a look that she gives me, <laughs> but in the past, I, I wouldn't have recognized that she was even telling me to stop doing mm-hmm. so. So I, things are a lot better there now. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah, this is yeah, very insightful. And, and, and even, even just what you said, um, elevated my understanding of my self-worth there, oh, which good. is very helpful. Yeah. Totally. And I think one thing I want to add is when you're shooting people, there's a good reason for that. A Pisces rising is highly intuitive. Really a Virgo rising is too, but not quite as openly as a Pisces rising where like your sense of a person's energy and the truth of every level of their energy, your ability to like merge auras with other people. Like when you're saying you should, it probably is the right answer. You know, like the fact that people don't want to hear it doesn't make you wrong. You can still be (laughs) right, but keep it to yourself, you know, and set yourself up in a situation where then you have people coming to you who are saying, please merge with my aura and tell me, tell me what you see. That superpower isn't wrong. It just is like, you know, the guy with the laser eyes and he's got to wear the glasses. You got to like learn how to rein it in and then let it out in concentrated efforts, not just like shine it at everybody all the time. Cause yeah, they probably know like Gigi and I were talking before we got on here. Like a lot of people can't come to shadow work because they legit don't want to face the truth. So just because you're telling them, hey, you should do this, probably they should, but that doesn't mean that they're ready or that they're in their process and in a space to go through with what you're, the advice that you're giving them, but that doesn't mean you're bad at giving advice. So those are two very different things. And actually one of your superpowers could be to read people's energy and give them advice. So setting yourself up in business or with some kind of channel or outlet where you can offer your advice and let the people who resonate with it come and seek it out and receive it because they will like it. But yeah, dumping it on everybody all the time. I can, I can see why they probably don't like it. Well, and it, it's ironic because I have spent so many years feeling that I'm not intuitive that I, I resonate more as a sensor that I read people, how they see, you know, what are, what am I seeing? What am I, what am I hearing? You know, and, and, and not my friends have been like, you're stinking intuitive. Stop, stop that. And I'm just Mm -hmm. like, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm blocking, been blocking my ability to actually see that I am intuitive or if I was just taking it as reading the things that I was seeing, you know, because I consider myself and have considered myself sensing more Mm -hmm. than intuitive. I never, I feel like I've blocked a lot of my ability to feel for an extended period of time. Well, and and back into, yes. And I think that's why I separate you know, just because people tell you, stop telling me things or stop giving me your your advice or you're wrong or whatever, doesn't mean you're wrong. Doesn't mean you're bad at giving advice. Like the people's reaction was most likely a reaction to their own unwillingness to face up to what you were telling them. Your read on the situation was too accurate. You freaked them out (laughs) and they don't want to hear your truth. They don't want to hear their own truth. And so you walk away believing that you were wrong, that your interpretation 
that you said, hey, you should do this. And they're like, get out of my face. And you're like, oh, well, I guess I was wrong. I guess I didn't know. Yes, you did. They weren't open to it. And so it's two different skills. And so letting yourself believe in your own intuition is the only block that you have up between your ability to use it. And the block is believing these other people who weren't ready to hear what you said. And it's time, I think, to let that go and understand the deeper Aries energy that probably was just like burning them as you're offering this truth. You're like just singeing their face hairs a little bit. They're like, back up just a minute. Yeah. And it's just learning how to direct your own energy. But yeah, I'll bet them denying what you were calling out, what seemed so obvious to you, and then they deny it. And you're like, oh, I guess I didn't know. Like your accuracy, you have no idea your accuracy because people aren't honest most of the time. So they aren't a good judge on, and I would listen to your friends, you know, and even like with your friends, with your trusted people, give them your insights, give them your intuitive musings, ask if they're open to it. But, you know, I'm in my shadow work process of opening up to trusting my intuition. Can I give you a sense that I'm getting right now that's coming through? Can I share it with you? Sure. And then share it with them and see what happens. Because I, I'll bet that your, your awareness of your own accuracy climbs so fast mm -hmm. when you open up to believing that other people were just not ready to hear what you were saying. And one of the things that I've been doing lately, instead of giving my insight is asking questions related, trying to get them to explore it on their own. Because if I just put it in their face, I, I, I found it, if I can ask a question about it, they may inch towards what's going on and see something for themselves that if I would have told them, they would have just said, fuck you. That's you know? so powerful. Yeah. That, that method is such a good example of like the full arc of shadow work because you know your initial approach was to just be in people's faces with it and that didn't work it was painful they didn't like it there was rejection all of these things and now you've developed this other method that you would not have come to had your in their face approach worked you never would have learned how to question people to like give them little breadcrumbs to follow so they can find their own awareness and that I think is the trick of a Pisces rising is that you have such a clear view of other people that you got to just assume and remember that most of the time they are not ready. They are ignoring their own truth so much that the approach that you're doing of like giving them little questions to like, because maybe at the very first question, they're like mind blown. You're like, right. all right, that's enough for today. <laughs> like, I'll let you sit with that for a couple of weeks and I'll be back with the next question. Uh, spoiler, there's 98 more, but they're not ready, you know, and let them not be ready. That's okay. It doesn't change your own sense of the energy and what's going on. So yeah, leaning into that, it'll take, take some time. I mean, letting stuff come back out of the shadow and working with it successfully. I mean, it takes years. So the fact that you even know that this is something and that you're open to it. And I mean, it's, it's unfolding and it will continue to unfold. Thank you very much. Dude, like, how can you not be intuitive? Look at this. You got Pisces rising, a Cancer Mars and moon conjunct Uranus and Scorpio. You're here to make people genuinely uncomfortable. Like to speak truth in their face. Well, and I, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. At least the reason behind. <laughs> if I was a couple of years ago and you just told me I was here to make people uncomfortable, I would have been, oh, I bet. No, but it, it just helps me understand, you know, they had, I'm here to kind of put stuff in their face and a little bit and try and, do it in a, and, and I can potentially help them more by yes. being more reserved in my method of doing so. Yes. But like, I think there's space there where 
you get your initial perception, your initial intuitive download from their energy, which is like instantaneous and you have a whole file on them that like, here, here's all of this. And they're not ready for like even 1% of all the information that you just downloaded. So while they're not ready, flip that perspective inward and take just a second to carve out like how cool it is that I get such an immediate and complete download of a person's energy. Like that is a superpower. And instead of rushing to helping the other person with what you just received, just be grateful that you even have access to this much truth. And what you do with it from there is, I mean, the potential is endless as far as how much, how big the ripple effects can be. Um, but I think what you've discovered is to make ripple effects and like actually help people, they have to listen. You, you have to be heard. And if they're offended and immediately shut down because you're in their face, they don't listen and you can't make an impact. It's hard to be of service if they won't listen to what you're saying. So there's, there's power in this subtle approach of like totally hands off and just letting, letting the space be open to give them the one piece that they're truly ready for. That like every single, like let's just say every single person that comes into contact with you is ready for a piece of truth, one piece. And you to get that one piece have to download like a million pieces. And your cross to bear is that you have to keep a hold of 999,000 of them and only give them one. But mm. that one piece of truth could change their whole life. And just because they're not ready for all million doesn't mean that you don't need to give them the one. But figuring out how to soften your approach so that they will listen will have them receiving the one piece of truth and walking away with you having made an impact and they won't ever know about the 999,000 truths that you know that you didn't give them, but you'll know and you'll appreciate the level of your talent and your skill and what your soul came here to do. Awesome, thank you. Awesome, I know, it's so wonderful. I love this space. I genuinely love working with people's shadows and helping reframe things so that mm -hmm. we can see it with kinder eyes because nothing has to change for us to shift our perspective and see ourselves with more love as we as we really are so thank you for your energy both of you in this space today um I will ask now that we're at the end if either of you is opposed to me sharing this YouTube or this video on my YouTube channel Okay, cool. I didn't want to do that without permission because this was kind of like personal territory, but I do think it's, there's so many curious ones that they RSVP to all the events and then they don't come and I know they watch the recording. So hello to all of you who didn't come today. Um, but I hope there was something in here, whether you were here in person or you're catching the replay, I absolutely love this space. And yeah, if there's any questions or as you sit with these pieces, you're ready to come back for the next round. Let me know when that is and we'll put another group session on the calendar. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been a while, Christy. So it was nice to reconnect with you and same Gigi, always a pleasure. Um, I'm gonna kill the recording.